Do I win? Usually. My name is Charlie Parker. And my spiritual gift is dodgeball. When you ask Michael Jordan how he got to where he is right now, he'd say he practiced, practiced, practiced. Hey, Charlie, somebody called for you. He might say some other things, but the main thing would be practice. And that's what I do. I practice. I practice at home. I practice at work. I practice at school. I practice when people aren't looking and when people are looking. Hey, Charlie, I have an apple for you. Here, catch. And that's what makes me unique. The key to being a good dodgeball player is to be agile, like a spider monkey. Ironically, that's our team name. One of my moves is called the wing duck and the conspiracy theory. God gave some people the gift of compassion, some people the gift of love. He gave me the gift of dodgeball, and I'm going to use that unto him. Dodgeball. Do outstanding deeds. Go everywhere. Be all. Dodgeball. Hey, listen, Charlie, man. Lots of paper here. Got a stapler? The worst place to get hit is not the head, but the heart. Some people and girls don't understand the meaning of competition. I'm not sorry. For those who are more literally minded, dodgeball is not a spiritual gift. Okay? <laughs> it can be a gift, but it's not a spiritual gift. Uh, it's pretty important to understand the nature of spiritual gifts, isn't it? Uh, that, that silly illustration kind of points it out. And uh, one of the problems, I think, is not necessarily uh, thinking some things are spiritual gifts that aren't necessarily. That probably is not the problem nearly as much as not recognizing the overall importance of a spiritual gift and what the nature of those gifts are. It's far more important um, that we employ or identify our giftedness and employ it then we do and make an effort to do that than just showing up, okay? And just being a part or propping up a ministry and uh, not understanding what gifts are and how they're supposed to be used in the church can cripple the church. It literally can cause the church to be ineffective in its mission. And, and in fact, if it's not done, if we don't understand our giftedness, if we don't understand how God has, has blessed us with a spiritual gift and we don't use that in large part, it, makes, it ensures that we will not be effective in the mission because the mission to make disciples is carried, about, carried out by the employing or the use of our spiritual gifts as individuals. So in the past three weeks, we've talked a lot about a shared identity in the church, seeing ourselves as a church family, understanding our corporate or our shared identity and a common way of understanding that. And the Bible uses two analogies to talk about that identity. It uses the analogy of a, of a family that we are a spiritual family, God's family. And in, in Jesus carries that analogy out and even says he's the, the big brother, basically, of the, fa of the family, the firstborn from among the dead, he says. And then the other one that we've kind of camped out on is the body. As a physical body is made up of many members, so is the church made up of me many members to make a single body. And last week we pointed out uh, God adds to that body um, as he desires to, the church, very intentionally, and with great design, God adds to the body. And he does that on the basis of spiritual gifts. That is without, he doesn't just say, hey, I'm going to put you here and now I'm going to give you a gift in hindsight. But literally, the moment we are born again, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is an accompanying at least one spiritual gift that comes to a person's life that is, that is to be employed in the church. And, and as God designs the church and builds the church and adds to the church, it is in his sovereign wisdom that he does so in knowing how a spiritual gift will impact the body that he is adding that spiritual gift to. So what's the big deal? We don't hear a lot about spiritual gifts these days, do we? We don't talk about it a lot. It's not a conversation point often. Uh, are spiritual gifts really all that important? We could ask that question. We could ask what happens if we don't use them? What happens if we don't use the gifts that we have? What, what if I don't like the gift that I have? What if I am gifted to do something that I don't like to do? Or what if I'm not good at using my spiritual gifts? Or why does God give us gifts in the first place? Those are all questions that could kind of run through our minds as we talk about this. And I hope that they do. I hope that you're willing to ask 
those questions, and they're fair questions, and we're going to address all of those, but we're not going to necessarily major on any one of those because there's a bigger question at the heart of all of this. And if you have questions like that, please tune in today. I mean, I mean plug into what God might be saying because He is going to, I think, speak to us in a broader perspective to answer a lot of questions, but then hone that in. And I want to say this, kind of launch into this, is that I think that there are many Christians who are frustrated, many uh, followers of Jesus who are frustrated, maybe not to the point of feeling angry or you know, uh, acting out of that frustration, but inwardly there feels like there's friction because we're unfulfilled, because we're unaware of and not using our spiritual gifts. And I think that most of us do not, do not realize that's where that angst comes from or that unsettledness comes from or that, that feeling out of joint kind of comes from. It's because we don't, we've never thought about or never been taught about uh, or identified what God has gifted us to do and we certainly haven't often employed those things intentionally. I just would ask if you are one of those people just to pay attention or maybe Maybe you're one of the people who believes that you've identified your gift and understand what that is. Or maybe that, and, that, and that's a beautiful thing. This will be very affirming and encouraging to you. But there are a lot of people, I think, that are in the camp of thinking, I think I know what God has gifted me to do, but I'm not sure. And, and this should begin to solidify that and move you forward at least to take some steps so that you can nail that down. So I think it's very, very important that we tune in and understand what God has to say to us today. And, and I'm going to... Uh, just pray, and we're going to read the scriptures in segments today, so if you just let me pray, and then we're going to walk through that in segments by segment, and we're just going to ask God to speak to us right now. Would you pray with me? Father, your word is described in, its, in and of itself as the sword of the Spirit, and I want to ask you right now to use your word well beyond anything I could possibly do, that the power that is inherent in the spoken and the written word would be profoundly effective right now to accomplish your purposes and not mine and that you would use it to speak deeply into our lives with penetrating thoughts and convictions that would not just inform us but would literally transform us and so God we need you to do this we have not gathered here just to be social we have not gathered here just to be religious we've not gathered here just to check something off of the week we want to meet with you as we meet together we want to meet with you and we want to ask you to speak to us clearly you have our attentions, arms lifted high, hearts surrendered, abandoned to you. You have us. We give ourselves freely to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in 1 Corinthians. If you haven't turned there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we'll be looking at the first 11 verses, segment by segment. Some of the, now, all of God's Word is very, very important, but into uh, the very topic that we have, some of, these seg some of the segments of this passage of Scripture are, need more emphasis than others. And uh, as you'll see, we explain that, and I'll explain that as we go through. Now, verse, first three verses. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse, first three verses, he says, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be unaware. That's pretty important, right? Now, concerning this whole issue of spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be unaware. Now, listen to this. It sounds like a drastic change of topic, but it's not, and I'll explain it. He says, You know that when you were pagans... That is, before you came to Christ, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, what's going on here is the whole issue in, the first, in Corinthians, uh, in the church there, is that they're being led astray. And they are unaware of, and they're not being taught about spiritual gifts. And so Paul is basically saying the false teachers are trying to corrupt your mindset and here's how in the second in, in verses two and three here's how you can identify some of those uh, false teachers ba a very uh, clear synopsis of no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God in verse two he says no one speaking by the Spirit of God would ever say Jesus is a curse that is to deny the deity and the power and the authority in Jesus not a major point to today's passage but I did want you to understand that that this section of scripture is honed in on the identification of spiritual gifts and how important they are and that was the exact battle that the first that the this first century church or Corinthian church was going to be using and, and battling upon okay look at verse 4 he says now there is a variety of gifts but the same spirit notice the cadence to this this passage now there are a variety of gifts but the same spirit and there are a variety of ministries but the same Lord and there are a variety of effects 
but the same God who works all things in all persons. This statement has three parts. You could hear the cadence, I think, to that. Very intentional by Paul, a master of the Greek language, an incredible writer. And there's a lot in those verses that I want us to look at real quick. And this statement has those three parts, and that three parts is, are all intended for a purpose. And I hope that you picked up on the, on the cohesiveness of what he was saying. If you didn't, I'm going to explain it. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, okay? There's a lot of different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they are all born out of, they all come from or originate from the same Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gifts people in a variety of ways, but all the gifts that He employs or gives to people originate or come from Him, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is the Spirit, and He alone disperses spiritual gifts to the church. He alone does that. And it's very intentional, it's very deliberate. Okay, and then verse 5, the, there are a variety of ministries. There's all kinds of ministries. And the, and the word for ministry is the Greek word di, diakonia. And it's very close to the word we get deacon from, which means minister or to serve. But it, it means to carry out a service or ministry of divine things. That's what that word specifically means. There are a variety of ministries. And that word means a, to carry out a service or a ministry of divine things nature or of divine things. So there are a variety of ways to serve or minister in the church, obviously, and in and, and, and divine things, to carry out those ministries of divine things. But each one of those ministries is carried out in the name of the same Lord Jesus Christ. They're all done for the same purpose and the same surrender to the same Lord, okay? Variety of gifts all originate from the same Holy Spirit. Variety of ministries, how those, how those gifts are employed, but they're all done for the same Lord Jesus and His glory. Now look at the rest of this. He says in verse 6, there are a variety of effects. Effects is the Greek word energema. And it means to the result or the effect of God's power. It's only used right here uh, in one other place, I think, in the New Testament. The result or the effect of God's power being employed or carried out specifically through a person who's using their spiritual gift. So the last word was ministry, that is the type of ministry or service. This is the result of that service, okay? And so spiritual gift was the first thing he said in this, in this section, same Holy Spirit. Then there was a ministry for the same Lord Jesus, and the same effect is done for the same honor in the name of the glory of God. So there is a very clear Trinitarian view here, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, the Father God. And all of those, and then he walks through the same sequence as the spiritual gift, the ministry that it's used in, and the impact or the effect that that spiritual gift has. So there are many ways to use the gift or the, how the gift impacts the church, many ways that the gift, how the gift impacts the church. But it's the same God who makes each one of those gifts effective and powerful. The power of your gift, when it is employed, comes through God. In other words, if I stand to preach simply in my own human effort. It does not have the same effect or impact on the church as if I surrender to the power of God and let Him use that gift in and th or employ that gift in and through me. Okay, so th that's the, it's an incredible, incredible cohesive passage where Paul is talking about how beautiful and how, how much symmetry there is in this and how, how tied it is to the very identity of the Trinitarian God that we serve, the wholeness of His of his beauty coming through that diversity but all tying back to the very unity of who he is and the unity of the church and expressed through the gifts. So here's this, that sequence and it's, and it's incredible. So the Trinity is very, very clear in that. In verse 7 he says, but to each one, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. This bowled me over this week. Listen to this verse. To each one who has placed, when we say each one, let me identify that. When you come to a point of realizing you are separated from God by your sin, that you have no hope of bridging that gap through human effort or good deeds, and you surrender to the salvation of Jesus that is offered in Jesus through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is, he died on the cross for you, he was raised from the dead uh, for you, to offer you forgiveness of sin and eternal life. When you come to that point and you transfer your faith from self to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes in your life, then we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And an ongoing uh, journey helps us realize how powerful and profound that one reality is. But Paul uses a different phrase to describe this reality. He says, 
the Holy Spirit, he says, no, actually, let me back up. He says, to each one of you is given a manifestation of the Spirit. Do you hear what he's saying? Manifestation is a Greek word, uh, phanerosis, and it means to make something visible or observable. So listen to that verse again. He said, each one of you have a manifestation, something that makes the Spirit visible or observable. I think that is absolutely amazing because the Holy Spirit is some, such a mystery to us, right? That is, He blows like the wind, the Scripture says. He comes and goes without, without predictability or without sense of origin. That is, we don't know where He begins or ends. And, and, and so is the life that is moved along by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit can be so mysterious and seem so intangible or, or even um, uh, hard to figure out how He impacts or how He he relates to my common, ordinary, everyday life. Paul describes your spiritual gift, the gift that God has given you through the presence of the Holy Spirit, as, a, as something that makes tangible or something that makes the Holy Spirit visible or observable in your life. So check this out. Every single time you see someone else using their gift or you are in the presence or you are yourself expressing your gift, you are seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That is, there's no wondering, there's no, there's no, I wonder if that is, that literally you're seeing a manifestation, something that's makes the presence of the Holy Spirit visible and observable in your life. And that should be profoundly exciting that when we gather together and you see people teach or preach or sing or in the hallways encourage, affirm, offer mercy or you see people carrying out functions of administration or whatever that is you are literally don't just say hey that's cool somebody's using their spiritual gift you need to un understand that you are seeing the presence the observable presence of the Holy Spirit in our in our midst and that should be igniting to us electrifying profoundly affirming and, and truly, truly inspirational as we gather together. It should be one of the reasons we want to gather together is to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I love the Paul described it. Uh, your spiritual gift is described as a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, something that makes the Spirit of God observable and visible in our lives. So when a person identifies as and uses their, expresses their spiritual gift, it's literally, literally, not, not philosophically, not just some theological realization. It's a literal, observable presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. That's life-changing. It's life-changing for me, I know for sure. I was um, struck by that. I've been struck throughout this how, um, how much of the importance of the nature of spiritual gifts and the use of spiritual gifts has been just overlooked in my, in my life. This was like, wow, I feel like I'm going to first grade, but I'm so excited to be there because I'm learning so much. And this is such a, this is one of them. Verse 7 was one of the things that I just latched onto. And I thought, oh, Father, this is so, so rich. I couldn't wait to get here. I couldn't wait here to get here this morning to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your lives. As, as, as some of you speak words of grace to each other, and as I see you and know some of your gifts, I can, I can recall times of actually seeing you use your gift and employ your gift and knowing, man, every time that happens, we can say, man, that's the Holy Spirit. God is present. God is moving, and He is present in our, in our place. The Spirit, so the Spirit manifests Himself, makes Himself visible or observable for the common good, right? That's what He says. It's through the common good of the church. It's not just so I can say, wow, the Holy Spirit's working in me, but we can say the Holy Spirit is present in us, and that makes us effective and powerful in making Jesus Christ known in the darkness of this world. That's what makes us powerful and effective. Not good effort, not good organization, not a strategic plan, but the manifestation, the carrying out of the Holy Spirit's gifts in our lives. So in verses, let me move on, verses 8, 9, and 10 are talking about just various gifts that are, that are used. He says somebody is given the gift of faith by the same Spirit and to another the effecting of miracles and another prophecy. And he just he itemizes several kinds of spiritual gifts. But he keeps on going back to the constant refrain, same spirit. The emphasis in those verses is that they all originate from the same spirit. There's a massive tendency, apparently, at least in the Corinthian church, and it may be, it may be a very common tendency in the church, that when we really identify gifts, there's a, a great propensity to, to segment and say, well, I have this gift, and you have that gift, and that creates difference. 
And Paul is going back and pounding this refrain of saying, different gifts, same Spirit. Different gifts, same Lord Jesus. Different gifts, same God the Father. Different gifts, one body. Okay? So as we move into this, I want you to be aware that the diversity is a beautiful part of our cohesiveness and unity. And we have to have it, okay? Do not let the identification of gifts ever segment you or, or sep segregate you or separate you from other people in terms of feeling less or more. Paul talks about this if you want to read more about that, about never ever undervalue anybody's spiritual gift or think that it is less important in the body than somebody else's, okay? Never do that. Never make that mistake. Same spirit, same spirit, same spirit, all in one. Beautiful, beautiful. Does a great job with that, Paul does as we should expect. Verse 11, he says, But one and the same Spirit, again, works all these things, that is the manifestation of the Spirit, the working of your gifts, the, the expression of your gifts. One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. Just a, an incredible walking through of diversity creating unity, diversity creating cohesiveness and interdependence. So delegation of the gifts is a sovereign work, the standalone work of the Holy Spirit of God, and it's not in our control whatsoever. There was a tendency for them to want certain gifts. And I think that would probably translate to 2,000 years later. For some people think, if you were just sitting back, say, well, I want the gift of music. I want to, I want to be up front and noticed and, and in the spotlight. I want to be a, a preacher or a teacher. I want people to give me accolades. And then some of you would say, well, I want this gift or I want that gift. I, you know, and we, we could have the tendency to say, especially in the ignorance of our own gifts and prior to identifying them and using them, there would be a propensity or a tendency to think that some gifts are better than other gifts. But I want to tell you something that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what your gift is, because when you identify it and use it, you will find out that you will be so satisfied and joyful in the expression of your gift no matter what it is, whether it is up here or back there, so to speak, in the back rooms. When no one ever notices, when your spiritual gift leads you to do something that is unobservable by the masses, uh, in large part, guess what? You find great satisfaction and joy in that. That's the nature of your gift. It is only in the ignorance, of the, and I say that in, in not a derogatory way, meaning a lack of awareness, is only in the lack of awareness of your gift and the use of your gift that we come to false assumptions about how it should look and how it should play out. So it is very important. That's why Paul starts this whole passage. I don't want you to be unaware of, of your spiritual gifts. We need to have an awareness, a cognizance of this. So delegation of the gifts, remember, is the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't get to say, God, give me this one. Or God, why didn't you give me that one? Or God, why do they have that one and I have this one? You don't get to do any of that. And the gifts should not bring us to that point of, of division ever, ever. Romans 8 and 9 says this. It says, however, you are not in the flesh, right? That is, who, those who have been born again are not just simply living in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now listen to what he says. Listen to this truth. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Do you know what he just said? If the Holy Spirit does not live in you, you have not been saved. You have not been born again. It is impossible to be rescued by the, 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 the God of the universe and not have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it in the positive. My wife would be proud of me speaking in the positive. That is, every time a person is saved, they are indwelled with the Holy Spirit without fail. So if you've been born again, you have the Holy Spirit. And the, the next conclusion is what? If you have the Holy Spirit, you have a spiritual gift, at least one. And so, obviously, those without the Spirit don't have a spiritual gift. Those without the Spirit of God do not have a spiritual gift. They may have talents and abilities that they've honed and mastered. Those are very different than spiritual gifts. Okay, and let me briefly describe that just very briefly the difference between a spiritual gift and talent at the baseline of that is a spiritual gift is always used and is effective in the glory of the church and the health of the church a talent is almost always used in the expression of the glory for self and an ability a talent can be developed a talent can be acquired a gift cannot it is a gift, okay? That's a really huge overview of how to distinguish those two things, but there is a distinguishment. 
So that's why it's so important to understand each one is given the gift of the manifestation of the Spirit of the common good. That we have the Holy Spirit. Inevitably you have the Holy Spirit. There, is te there are teachings in other doctrines that would teach you that, that there are different stages of or, or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You don't get all of the Holy Spirit uh, at the moment of salvation. And that the coming of the Holy Spirit is always marked not only by an awareness, but of the use and employment of the spiritual gift. That is false teaching. There are many people sitting here today who are profound evidence of the fact that you can be saved and unaware of your gift, okay? J profound, uh, profound truth there, okay? So do not think, here's what I'm getting at. I don't want anybody here today to say, well, I thought I was saved, but I don't know what my spiritual gift is, so I don't know if I'm saved, all right? What I'm saying is you go back to determine your salvation, not based on whether you've identified your gift. Okay, walk with me here, please, because I don't want anybody confused. You cannot sit here today and say, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. And you're saying, if, I have, if I've been saved, I have the Holy Spirit, I have a spiritual gift. So if I don't know what my gift is, am I really saved? No, do not go there. Because here is what happens. When you are born again, and you have the Holy Spirit who comes to indwell your life, whether you're 5 or 55 doesn't matter the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. You become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now what happens is the church, like this one, fails in its effort, or its responsibility rather, to bring about the teaching that, that causes us to be aware of the Holy Spirit and to identify that gift. So you, you have this untapped resource because spiritual leaders like myself have not done the job that they've needed to do in terms of raising our awareness, equipping the saints, and showing them how to identify and employ that gift. Okay? So do not, that, that, the responsibility lies here, I believe, in, in the fact that many of us are sitting here saying, well, I thought I was saved, and I am saved, but I don't know what my gift is. That is a profound reality. That can happen. And it's probably the case for many of us in this room today. Okay? So my big effort there is just simply say this, don't come to a bad conclusion here. Don't think, well, I don't know what my gift is. I wonder if I'm saved. Now, you go back to determine your salvation, whether you can declare, just like Paul said at the very beginning of this passage, can you declare with your heart, Jesus is Lord. The Bible says you can't do that except by the prompting and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. If you can declare that, the Bible says you've been born again. If you can declare that with your heart, not just your mouth. All right? So, here's the reality we need to embrace today. The Holy Spirit is present in each Jesus follower. Now let that sink in. It just sounds so simple and I know I, it's a constant refrain that I've, that I've pounded on here for a while, but I just want us to let that sink in. The Holy Spirit is present and indwells in a very literal, mysteri mysterious way, but a very literal way, each believer here. Could you let that just be a reality that would move you right now? That if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are a temple of God. You don't go to a temple. This is not one. You don't go to a place where you can connect with God. You have become the dwelling place of God. This is the very picture of the curtain in the temple being torn in half at Jesus' resurrection. So to, to say this, no more is access to God limited. You have yourself have become the high priest. We believe that in this evangelical church. We believe in the priesthood of the believer which means that the Holy Spirit lives in the believer you don't have a mediator called Casey you don't have a mediator called an elder or a deacon you don't have a mediator you have access to God if you're in a stranded desert island you have personal fellowship with God through what the Holy Spirit who where who's where in you not just somewhere with you but in you profound amazing I would say all right, so I want us to embrace that. You don't, you don't have to earn the gift. You don't have to wait for the gift. You don't have to develop the gift. It's there. You already have it. And it will work for the good of the whole church when you employ it. Listen, your spiritual gift will work for the good of the whole church, not even just this one, the church universal, because the church universal is on the same mission to make disciples, right? We're just a part of that mission but it will certainly benefit the whole of this local congregation, not just by making us famous in our day, but by making Jesus famous in our day. So it will also serve to be a constant reminder. I think this is awesome. This is something that is new for me, a new teaching that has really you know, etched its way into my heart. It's a constant reminder of the almost unbelievable reality 
that the Holy Spirit is literally, literally present in me. I'm telling you, this is a new day of preaching for me because I have not been cognizant. I'm always aware of my dependence upon God's power to preach the Word of God. Always cognizant of that because I've done it wrong so many times when I've done this in my own effort, my own preparation, and I think, man, I said everything I needed to say, but why was it so terrible? And it is self-effort. So today, it is a beautiful thing in my life to sit here and feel the ebb and the flow of the Holy Spirit, being aware that this is a manifestation. As I declare God's Word to you, in the, in the employment of my spiritual gift, this is a manifestation of the Spirit of God in our midst, in our presence. It, you, it's observable. And I'm, I get to celebrate that today. I get to uh, relish that. When you sit down at tables today and just to do our Bible study and you have a gifted teacher there, you get to see the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not just learn about God's Word, but see and, and, and experience the effective employment or the effective presence and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. That is amazing. See, the reason God selected you selected you individually to be a part of the body of Christ at Covenant was largely, if not exclusively, I don't know really where to land there, because of the spiritual gift that he has given you. It is a, a massive factor in the discerning wisdom of the Holy Spirit to place you at this place at this time. That is, we need your gift. We don't need you, just you. We need the you and your gift. You and I, guess what? We need the body. We need each other. But the body needs your gift. They need the use of it to come to pass. Well, I'll remind you or make you aware the use of your spiritual gift is in not any way, listen, tune in, please, to this. It's not in any way limited to or confined to church gatherings. Okay, let that sink in today. That is, you don't have to come here on Sunday to use your gift. You do not. You can go to a nursing home. You can go to your neighbor. You can sit down at your kitchen table to communicate God's word if that's your gift, to offer mercy if that is your gift. The gift of administration can be employed in a variety of ways. All of these gifts can be used. They're not, do not get into the mindset, I have to go into the structure of what we do as a, as a local body of Christ on Wednesdays or Sundays to use my gift, okay? So if God has you working outside of the realm of full-time ministry, your gifts should be used outside of of this setting too, okay? It should be employed in the world. It's what's going to help you be effective at making disciples and us effective at making disciples, all right? Now, if we're not using our spiritual gifts, I want to ask you this question and we're going to close with it. If we're not using our spiritual gifts to advance the mission of Jesus Christ to make disciples, if we're not largely using those gifts, then what are we using? If we're not dependent upon the Spirit of God moving in and through us to advance the mission of making disciples, then what is it we have to be relying on? Self. How good are we going to be at this? Not very good. You know, one of my frustrations, the clarity that's come to me through these last couple weeks is this. I have, and I'm not, I'm not trying to beat myself up publicly so you think how humble I am, but I've just, this is honesty. I have not, I've looked back over the last eight years and go, where have I been on this? You know, I don't feel defeated or discouraged. I'm like, I'm glad I know it. But where have I been on this? How are we trying to say, hey, church, we're supposed to go do what? You tell me, what's our mission? To make disciples. How do we do that, right? <laughs> We've never talked about it. How do we do that? We don't just get people to come to a worship service, a Bible study, and a life group. The, the, the inner workings and the... the absolutely essential component of that is the body of Christ employing their spiritual gifts and the diversity of that bringing great unity to that we can't make disciples if we're not using our gifts I haven't led us to use our gifts and I am I, for strange maybe I should be I'm not necessarily ashamed I'm not sure if God just took blinders off or if I had blinders on purposefully but today is a new day we're gonna awaken to this we're gonna move into this and I believe the reason we're saying, why do we know the mission so clearly? Why do we have such a great fellowship? And why are we so marginally effective at making disciples? That's been my frustration. Is why are people so seldomly coming to faith in Christ? 
Why are we not seeing a greater movement in that area? Why are we not seeing even a greater movement of transformation in people's lives who are already followers of Jesus? It's because we have not employed the use of our spiritual gifts. And we can't do the mission apart from that. Duh! Right? Light bulb come on and go, where in the world was I? Thank you for not firing me over the last seven years saying, you know, Casey, we can't do this in our own strength. And I would say, of course we can't. And then you could say, well, what are we doing then? Are we using our spiritual gifts? No, haven't even hardly mentioned that. We hadn't. All right. So I want to ask you to do this. Remember, as you discuss your spiritual gifts with each other, to use these two markers. Because here's what we're going to do. Here's the, the doing part. Here's what I want you to latch on to, all right? So we have to identify and use our gifts. Those are two parts of the same thing, all right? Identify and use. So one of the ways that I want you to immediately begin to embrace the identification part is by having conversations with friends and family who know you and love you and can speak into your life. Now, one, two markers that we're going to talk about over and over through this process is your spiritual gift will always be marked by two things when you use it. First will be, I don't know which one I listed first. Uh, the first will be you'll be effective. No one's, God does not give you a spiritual gift that you stink at. You know, I was like, I gave him the gift of preaching, but man, he's terrible. He's terrible. Oh, should have given him another one, Spirit. I know, I know, he's a loser. No, no one's doing that. God says if he gives you the gift, it's employed, you'll be effective at it. Secondly, God does not give you a gift that makes you miserable. Do you know how I know that I don't have the spiritual gift of administration? I stink at it, and I don't like it at all. Okay? Now listen, all right? There could be a cop out that comes right here. Says, we need somebody to take out the trash. And everybody goes, I don't have the gift of service. I'm not taking out the trash. That's baloney and you know that, all right? All right? <laughs> Your spiritual gift does not exempt you just from tasks that need to be done that you don't like, all right? So you don't get to pull the I don't have that gift card on that level, all right? You know what I mean. You'll be effective. You'll find joy. Now, simply trying to find different ways of serving Christ can also be an effective way of moving through this and finding. Try things. Just don't get stuck. If you wonder if you have the gift of teaching, guess what? Ask some people around you if they think you have that gift and then try it. But if people around you go, man, that's not working very good, then step out and try something else. All right? Now, here's what we're going to do. I want to ask you to pray for God to begin to clarify. This is the most essential step you'll take. God, show me what my gift is. Okay? I want you to clarify that. Now, secondly, I want you to ask the people who know you best to share with you what they see in you, potentially, that could be a spiritual gift. Now, here's the danger here, is that you're asking human beings, and they might be right, and they might be wrong. All right, so you're using that as one piece of a much bigger puzzle. You're not saying definitively, Mike, it's a good friend, tell me what my gift is. And Mike says, well, your gift is this. And you go, oh, that's my spiritual gift. And you never question it again. Don't do that. Just use it as one piece of the puzzle of identifying and moving you forward. But we're going to do more to help you there. Um, I think that uh, the third thing is also help, you know, speak into other people's lives. Especially when you sit down in your life groups this week. Be willing, we're having this conversation in my life group right now, to speak across the room and say, man, I think, you know, I see this in you. You just need, you don't even have to know the name of the spiritual gift. You can just say, I see you doing this, and you do this well. I don't know what that means or how that's identified as a gift, but if you see somebody that's constantly loving on people, encouraging people, or somebody who's just over-the-top generous with people, or someone who organizes things well, you know, on and on, just speak to what you see them doing without figuring out, trying to figure out the name for the gift. That's not the important part, all right? The important part is, man, I see you doing this, and it really seems like you enjoy it and that you're good at it. And maybe we need to move forward and see how we can uh, figure that out in terms of a spiritual gift. Now, here's the, here's the bigger picture. This is the next step beyond this. In the next few weeks, I had an awesome meeting with Peg Davis and Cindy Hockenberger this week to talk about a course, it's an eight-week course called Networking, and it's a pretty in-depth look at um, how to figure out what your personality makeup is, what your spiritual gifts probably are, and the thing about networking that I was so struck by as they presented this to me is that it says here are the, the uses, but here are also some potential dangers of your gift. Do you know your spiritual gifts is oftentimes come with some liabilities? Um, 
absolutely do, and to identify all that, and to actually walk you all the way through the point of seeing potential places of service in this church and how to employ them. When I say in this church, I just mean in this body. I don't mean in the confines of this building, okay? So we've got a next step coming beyond the, the more loosely organized, hey, have conversations and look at that. We've got a next step that's coming. I don't know exactly when or how uh, that's going to be employed, but it is going to come, all right? We think that's really, really important. Hopefully, my desire is to find something, whether it's networking or something, that's an ongoing thing. As people come into the church, we intentionally at the outset, right, say, hey, let's figure out what God has gifted you to do. And then you're aware. And so we don't just try to find jobs for people. Listen, church, we don't want to do that. We don't want to burn anybody out and say, hey, get to work. You get to work, uh, we're just saying not get to work. We're saying get in sync with the Holy Spirit and the gift that he's given you. This is an exciting new day in our church. I promise you that. You may not feel the excitement that I feel, but you will. Because the tide of God's Spirit is going to wash into our lives and move in a powerful way. It's inevitable if you begin to identify your gifts and use them. Listen, that's, it's an inevitable movement of God that is profound that will happen in this place. And I don't mean, again, the cinder block walls, but in this fellowship of people as we disperse to be disciples in the body as the body in this city it'll be a great movement of God I promise you I assure you we're going to walk you through that thank you for your patience and, and diligence in walking through kind of a, a sermon that is a little more heady maybe in, in thought process but I want you to engage that I'm not saying necessarily deep but I, I, we need to know some things about this so that we can do some things about this so hopefully that's been helpful I know it has been in my life and I'm excited to see how God uses it in your life. So let's pray he does, all right? Pray we let him, because I know he desires to. Father, today we know that you have given a spiritual gift, at least one of them, to every single person in this room. Even these children who have professed faith in you have, an, have a spiritual gift that will be honed and developed as they mature and, and fully express themselves as followers of Christ. They'll uh, know that gift and use that gift. And Father, maybe some people have been here for ages and never clearly identified their spiritual gift. Never used it. Always wondered why they feel uh, kind of like they're, they're, they're out of sync, and disjointed in the body, because their Father, we have been. And God, I thank you for the grace that you've delivered very convicting news into my life with, that I don't feel like I've got to, to just beat myself up. Uh, um, Lord, for whatever reason, there's been a blindedness to this, or an unawareness, whether, no matter what it is, I just thank you for making me aware, making our leaders in agreement that this is a direction we have to go, not that we should, but we have to. And I pray, God, that in the next few months, in this next year, there would just be a tide of disciple-making that would crash upon the shores of Topeka, Kansas. God, that it would be infectious and contagious from one body of Christ to another and, and, and across denominations and throughout our city and even through our state that there would just be a great movement of God as the people of God pick up the very gift that you've given them and use them for your glory that you, God, would be unrelenting in drawing people to you and transforming lives. We love you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for the manifestation of the Spirit in our lives. It is in Jesus' great name. Amen. Hey, it's exciting. Man, if God has got you right now and saying, I think, I think, I think, I think it is, I think it is, we'll talk to you. Listen, if you want to talk to me about your spiritual gift or what you think it is, we'll have a conversation uh, right after this service if you want to or after church. If you don't know and you just want to bring it up in your life group, listen, I'm telling you, life group leaders, let it happen today or tomorrow or the next day. And, and make sure that those people get the chance to, to talk it out with the people who are doing life with them. If you're not in a life group, uh, we, you, you have really a really big life group right here. And we'll, we'll love on you and we'll, we'll uh, help you identify that gift if you'll give us a chance to have that conversation with you, okay? So let's settle right now before God, before the throne of God. And I want you to meditate on... I want you to think through, I'm not trying to direct the thoughts, if the Holy Spirit has you a different place, go to a different place, but man, I just love you to let it soak in. It's your spiritual gift is a manifestation, it's something that makes the Spirit observable and visible in your life. Just let that truth sink in, and it'll be life-changing in and of itself, it has been for me. If God's speaking something entirely different to you, you have this chance to kind of nail that down. If you want to tap me on the shoulder and pray, if you want to come to the altar and pray, you can. Grab a friend, pray over to the side. You can do that, okay? This is our response time, so let's do that. Let's respond.